Science and Technology Group in, at the Jet Center in Winchester, and he gave his talk, which was very, very excellent uh, last year. And so I thought it would be very good. And he, he needs a ukulele band as well, and does many other things in the town of Winchester. Thank you, Don. Great. Thank you all for coming. This is uh, very exciting. Oh, thank you. Um, today, uh, I'm going to go by a pseudonym, uh, Joe Pot, D J I L P M H. The D is silent. But um, we'll uh, talk about the dark web and why it's not the evil, you know, icky place that uh, journalists make it out to be, and uh, where, where they're the valid and legitimate. <coughs> and uh, appropriate uses for, for the dark web. Before I actually start on the presentation, I want to do a uh, little sidebar. Seeing as we're, we have so many uh, people interested in science and technology, I want to do a Venn diagram. And I want you to start thinking a little bit about where you might fit into this Venn diagram and where people you know who fit into this Venn diagram. Okay. The first category on top is IQ. The second category is obsession. And the third category is social awkwardness. <laughs> or the awareness of that social awkwardness, right? Right in the middle, bingo. <laughs> so people that are smart, right, they, they, they know how to work through logical things to a conclusion and the obsession, when the two of them come together, they're geeks. Now, geeks are good, right? Because Steve Jobs was a geek. And you, you, with the obsession and the smartness, you get into the depth of certain things. If you're smart, but socially awkward, ah, uh, but you don't have the depth of uh, investigation, right? Ah, uh, that becomes, unfortunately, a dork. <laughs> I know none of you are dorks, right? but, uh, but even if you were, even if you identify someone as a dork, there's hope for them, and I'll show you why. Socially awkward and obsessed, but without smarts, okay, that is called a stalker. <laughs> So um, I, I don't think we have to worry about it because most of, most of you have uh, are pretty smart in this one, right? But the that's the one in the middle, right? This is called a nerd, right? You're, you're, you're aware enough of social awkwardness to know when to just shut up, right? But uh, you're also not so smooth in mixing at the cocktail party. Okay. So anyway, so I want you to kind of it just just sidebar entertainment. Think about where you fit, where your friends fit, and oh yeah, I was saying there's hope for dorks, right? All they need to do is pick up an obsession. And if you can actually <laughs> you can move from dork to nerd, right? And uh, how much better could that be? Well, well that it depends upon what obsession they pick up on. Oh, I'm sorry, that's true. Yeah, you have to have a, a legitimate one that doesn't, uh, yeah, creep out people. Within right. social norms. Like yes, that. within within a decent set of social norms. So thank you for uh, bearing up with that. <laughs> but uh, I stole it from a from a YouTube video. But uh, it's, it's entertaining enough that I thought you might enjoy it. So let me see. I'm going to go by paper because my memory is failing. So tour for security. Um, 
Today we're going to talk about the dark web, right? The dark web, there's another name, oh, I better plug this in. It's another name for Tor is the dark web. Can I go? Yes, okay. So, oh, I, I got it, I got it. All the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. So Tor, T-O-R, is short for the Onion Router. Onion because it's many layers of network connections, and uh, that's how it accomplishes its uh, goal. I'm going to talk about Tor for security, or the appropriate use of Tor. Because what we found is, when you talk about the dark web, I think a lot of journalists will tell you, Ew, it's the icky place where drugs are sold. And um, there's, uh, you can buy AR-15s and uh, there's white, white multicolor slavery going on, right? And um, the thing is, the dark web being Tor, I'll, just, I'll say this because I, I want to say it many times. Tor is just a technology. And so if we were to say we have to stay out of Tor because Tor is icky and that's where criminals hang out, well, we might as well also say criminals use guns. Guns are icky. So let's have all law enforcement eliminate the use of guns or criminals use cars to get away, then our police shouldn't use cars because they're, criminals use them and they're icky, right? Um, so anyway, I don't want to, so who knows the uh, reference here, how I learned learn to... Well, that's the bomb. Yes, yes. 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 right. Peter Sellers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How I learned to... Dr. Uh, Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. It, a classic movie, though. I, I, I recommend a, a, a re-viewing almost any time. All the libraries have it. So today, I'm going to do a standard disclaimer. Uh, beware of your personal and your employer's code of conduct. Don't uh, do anything stupid. Um, use, a, use of Tor carries its own risks. And seek professional help. Right, that applies to many parts of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> so, seriously, see, um, if you have an interest, feel free to drop me an email. I will answer, and we can talk about this informally uh, at, you know, at the at the at the, pl at the coffee shop without the cameras, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can. You, you have to decide for yourself whether you trust someone enough to, to talk about this. So approach me with suspicion. <laughs> so Tor is uh, commonly uh, known as the dark web, right? It has a terrible reputation. And so here's the in, in, interesting thing to me that I found. Compliance to corporate policy. Now, I used to work for a big company, and we had a mostly unwritten policy that we as security, members of the security team, security fresh profession, should not and will not participate in criminal activity. So when WikiLeaks came out with uh, you know, hacking tools and so forth. It was, they're the product of criminal activity. So we as professionals with, uh, who are supposed to be wearing the white hats, we were not supposed to touch them in, in general, right? Now, if you had a specific interest and you got specific permission and developed a team to work on those tools, that's one thing. But as a regular employee, touching the, the, the product of criminal activity is a, is a dismissible offense. 
So, but uh, the, the other most scary thing to me uh, back in, it was two years ago when I got my last statistic, six out of seven security professionals, people that are supposed that claim to be in the field of security, never touched it. Mm. Partly because of these constraints uh, from corporate uh, you know, policy. Don't touch the product of criminal activity, right? So what are you supposed to do? Well, Tor is a big space, and uh, I'm going to talk about some use cases for Tor that do not involve crime or unethical activities, what you should do about Tor if you're responsible for a network, and you know, maybe your home network isn't that big a deal. But uh, it's important to you. And um, if we have time, we're going to talk about the uh, benefit of privacy. Because Tor, ultimately, is a tool to enhance privacy. And you know, while I'm going to toss this out there and let you guys think about this for a little bit, what does privacy mean to you? Okay, um, if you look, it, it's sometimes interesting, some of the, uh, many of the companies, many of the large companies will have whatever domain they have, and you say add slash privacy, you'll get to their privacy policy, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the uh, telephone companies, uh, at and if you go to at and website, att.com slash privacy, you hit enter and there's a nice privacy policy, right? And one of the things it says, and, and this is one of the things where you have to take everything with uh, skepticism, great skepticism. The last time I looked, the at and policy said something about, oh, we respect your privacy. We will protect it to the greatest extent possible, and this is similar among all the other companies. We will not sell your information. Mm -hmm. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. But wait a minute, they don't say anything about giving it away. <laughs> you know, the, the, and further down you'll see, um, oh, we might share it with our business partners who will help you with what you need. Well, what do you think? How do how do people know what you need, right? <laughs> They're looking at what you're doing. And um, anyway, so I'm sorry, enough digression. Think about what privacy means to you. Um, I'm going to quickly go through Tor and why it work, how it works. This is, uh, this is one of the first, one of the best descriptions. I stole it from somebody that describes how Tor works. Okay, We're going to do Tor. And uh, I'm sorry, so we do tour security use cases, right? And uh, what you should do. So uh, let's do that first thing about how it works, right? It's a collection of cooperating message delivery, I'll call them postal workers because then they pass messages along, right? Tor, uh, things that pass messages along, they're called relays pretty obvious, right? And uh, I'll have the slides. I think you guys all have the slides. So uh, feel free to we share. We will get them after yes. OK. Um, but there's the uh, in how to explain Tor browser to your grandmother, right? I mean, this is about as straightforward as we can get. So think about messaging postcards versus letters and envelopes, right? Postcards are plain text. Anybody can read them. You're any carrier that's uh, <coughs> bringing your letter can read that, yes, you did go to Bermuda, right? And uh, you had a great time, you stayed, blah, 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 and you met uh, Uncle Fred and uh, had a great time. So all sorts of information is available on postcards. But if you seal it in an envelope, the, in theory, the, the postal carrier can't read it, right? They cannot read the contents. 
So, <coughs> um, envelopes is like encryption, right? They're, they're private talk, they're private information. So, uh, let me just start with this, right? This is the postcard. Peter the Postman is getting, uh, um, well, Alice is sending a postcard to Bob, A to B. Peter the Postman says, um, can read all the messages, all the contents of all the messages. This is the old and probably existing way things work. If you have an envelope, though, Peter the Postman knows that Alice is talking to Bob, but doesn't know what she's saying, which is already one important thing. But <coughs> Peter, knowing that Alice is talking to Bob, is already revealing quite a bit, uh, if, if you think about it, right? Because uh, if you uh, think about today's hearings, who talked to whom? Um, because there was uh, what the whistleblower said, he talked to somebody. Well, if Peter knows that the whistleblower talked to somebody, um, that other end, boom, it's wide open, right? So the way Tor works is, ah, OK. Alice seals her message in an envelope and gives it to Peter. Peter puts it into a second envelope and gives it to Paul, a second postman. Paul puts it into a third envelope and gives, delivers it to Bob. Okay, now, Bob only knows something was delivered by Paul. Bob has no idea that Peter was some in the, somewhere in the mix. Bob has no idea where Alice is because everything's sealed up. Now, when the message are finally arrives, Bob needs a way to open up the envelopes, right? And so he does. Mm -hmm. So the message is, your suspenders are hot, smiley face, right? Mm -hmm. So Alice is telling Bob this, uh, this message. Peter knows the message came from Alice, but when it arrives at Paul, the only thing Paul knows is a message came in from Peter, it's going to Bob. Mm -hmm. He has no idea that the message originated with Alice. He just knows something is coming from Peter. Okay? So what this does is it anonymizes the location of the sender and, in fact, the receiver. Both ends are no longer locked down to a specific IP address. So, you know the importance of IP addresses, right? Uh, CSI, uh, whatever, uh, law enforcement, uh, TV shows, they'll say, Did you, were you able to trace that IP address? Well, if you know someone's IP address, you know where that computer is that's sending a message. Uh, because the service provider knows which lines were brought out to which locations. Yes, but this picture doesn't, <coughs> Alice has to somehow address her message to yes. Bob, and right. doesn't Peter then know where Oh yeah, well Peter is? knows it's going to go to Bob. Okay. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. But it hides Alice's information from Paul, and so, and Bob doesn't know where she is. She, you know, Bob is opening the envelope ultimately and knows the messages from Alice and the contents. And so Bob knows it's coming from Alice, which is fine. But Bob has no way of determining where Alice is. It's a location protection only. So if you have a message and it's delivered and it's revealed, there's no secrets here, right? Uh, everything that Alice is saying is now revealed to Bob. Um, so if you're trying to 
uh, be a whistleblower, right, and you put in your real name and your real phone number and your real address, well, you're not anonymous anymore. You're just a whistleblower, right? Any other specific questions? Yes. So basically, between scenario two and scenario three in your presentation, Peter has the same information he always had. Yes, that's true. He knows he knows the sender and the receiver, yep. but not the contents. Right. So his role has not changed. He has not changed. So he's the guy you want to subpoena. <laughs> <laughs> if you could. Right. No. So part of the way Tor works is the first relay, which is Peter, right, is randomly selected among tens of thousands of potential relays. Um, right, no, so, so ingress relays, the first person going in, and egress relays, the place coming out, are critically important. And uh, you can bet many uh, government agencies with a lot of money, they're putting in their own relays and looking for that, you know, occasional hit where their <coughs> relay is being uh, selected and they're trying as much as they can to uh, examine the patterns of traffic. Yes? I thought that in many cases IP addresses are not uh, firm and kept the same <coughs> over time. That's correct. Yeah. But at a particular time, it is. So if you go into the library and use a library computer, um, that IP address for that computer might, might change. But that block is well identified as being within the facility. And uh, for better or worse, there are cameras all over uh, the Winchester Public Library now. Um, and so if, if they know a certain message was sent at a particular time from even a temporarily assigned IP address, they can look at the cameras and follow a lot of things. Yes, go ahead. Is, that, is Bob able to respond to Alice? Yes, right, because he has all the envelopes and all the, uh, all the information, so he can repackage and send it back using more or less the same mechanism. Because Bob's location, if you flip it around, Bob needs to protect the, his actual, no, I'm sorry, no, Bob, Bob, um, depending, depending on whether it's a conventional service, right, an IP address, or actually on tour there are these things called hidden services that can only be reached on Tor. In which case, the, there's an address, but it's not tied to a physical location. Hmm. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, um, is it typical for senders to also run relays, in which case the ingress point would not be detectable as the sender, but it could be hidden as yeah. Another forward and relay. So yeah. you're balancing two things here. One of them is uh, that you are controlling the relay, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But if you consistently use the same relay, yeah. that's not so good mm -hmm. because then you become predictable. Right. If somebody's monitoring Peter's traffic, yeah. is there a delay or anything on these messages? Where it comes no, they, they out? Get, so you see it comes out. And yep. the message size is going to stay roughly the same, right? Uh, so somebody could uh, put A and B together. They, the uh, monitoring what's going on with Peter. Right? I will tell you, many three-letter agencies and many uh, nation states have been beating on this problem for a long time. And um, so far, TOR's integrity, its ability to anonymize, mm -hmm. has remained intact. So, uh, how, how do we know that? I mean, they're not going to tell us. Yet. No, well, okay. So, there are um, criminal elements in the world uh, that any law enforcement organization would take down uh, at a heartbeat if they could find out, right? So, um, 
slavery, human slavery. I mean, it's completely unsupportable, right? <laughs> Never mind drugs. I mean, some people think drugs are okay. I personally don't. <laughs> I voted against the marijuana bill, right? But uh, there are uh, ability to purchase guns, right? Um, why, you know, law enforcement, if they had the ability, you would think that they would take them down. In yeah. I mean, remember in World War II, they, they abandoned people that see oh, in order that's not true. to compromise okay. their indulgence. Yeah, yes. right. yeah. That's, that's possible. But Silk Road so, was taken down. What's that? Silk Road was taken down. Yes, but it was not through a defect of tour. It was a <coughs> loss of discipline. They took down a, one of the, just this year, a drug dealer was taken down, right? And what, they, what happened was the FBI was doing some buys and they were talking with the sellers and they said, hey, you want some help laundering your money? And the drug sellers were so greedy, they said, oh, another chance to launder money. Let's talk to these people, right? And when they met, they said, come with me, sir, right? <laughs> we have bracelets for you. Um, so breaking down of discipline is, uh, is how people uh, take down drug sites. It's not the technology of Tor that has failed, and, and, in my opinion. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, one more. One more. I saw on your last slide, slide about the government that started this. Who runs the tour? It's it? a volunteer collaboration among tens of thousands of people. You could run a tour relay if you wish. Mm -hmm. And uh, and tens of thousands of people around the world use uh, uh, donate resources to keep tour running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll get right back to you. Technology and software is always changing. People yes. improve it. Yeah. How do you tell tens of thousands of people from now on you have to use an asterisk over there? Oh, no. So um, the, the Tor Project, torproject.org is the central clearinghouse. Okay. New software updates, security patches, they all come from so that. So who source. runs that? It's another nonprofit volunteer organization. Okay. Okay. So China, <laughs> the Great Firewall of China has been some of the most effective firewalls to block the use of Tor. Okay. Now, the standards for using Tor, the software is all public, it's open source, anybody can look at the code. So once a new version comes out, the Chinese go look at the code and say, okay, how are we going to stop it? How are we going to break it? Okay, and they do. It's China is one of the few places on on Earth where Tor often fails. I'll say often because there's really cool technology coming out. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think I have the word in here, but it's called scramble suit. Okay, I if you really want to follow that, contact me. Um, scramble suit takes network communications and masks itself as something else. You know, so when, I, when I'm talking to you, instead of looking like Tor, it actually looks like we're doing a Skype conversation mm -hmm. or a file transfer or a web download. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even if you look closely and say, hey, does that, well, it looks like a, a web transmission, right? So the scramble suit is able to put on different suits and pretend to be other traffic. So unless China wants to completely cut themselves off, which is not unthinkable, right? Um, scramble suit is one of the very promising technologies that uh, they, they can pretend to be almost anything. Pretty cool. Anyway, so China is is a real uh, not uh, happy about poor. So, let me quickly... Uh, just quickly on square. Yes, it, go ahead. Is that just as, as simple, if you will, as changing the, the uh, packet prologue for each? 
Uh, actually, it's simpler than that because you can take a plugin and put it in your software and it'll use Scramble Suit oh, instead so you, of Tor. So you can go through different ports and all yeah, that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I just took that last thing and I shrunk it down into a little box. That's Alice, Peter, Paul, Bob. Same thing happens over the internet, mm -hmm. right? Questions. So Tor hides the location of the servers. And in fact, it was created to protect American spies in hostile territories. Because if you have someone, a computer, on, in room 302 of the uh, Minsk Hilton, <laughs> making a connection to Langley, Virginia, you've just given up your spy. Right. So this was a technology that was created by the U.S. Navy to protect American spies, American assets overseas originally. But, you know, and so when, uh, you know, people make a better gun, criminals look at it and say, oh, I can use that. And that's what happened. Unfortunately, uh, the criminal elements have uh, taken over the, the technology where it, it should be a privacy resource that should be available and should be used by more people. Anyway, uh, it's great for whistleblowers. And um, so, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'll say it again. The, uh, there's nothing inherently evil or malicious about volunteering private message delivery. Uh, so, uh, there's so many contradictory things going on, right? There's free speech and then drifting over into hate speech. You know, who's going to decide? I don't know. I'm, I'm not smart enough to make that decision. But free speech, as I think we, most of us will say, is more valuable than <laughs> censorship. So we have to live with some of the downsides. Okay. I'm going to, this, I'm going to keep going. So, security use cases, right? Um, there's a, for privacy, right? Um, there's a, there's a USB bootable operating system called Tails that you can download, burn it to your USB drive, boot it from the USB drive, right? It's a Tor anonymous incognito <laughs> live system. So it's, it's a fully bootable operating system. Mm -hmm. You can put a, an encrypted partition on it. So when you boot it up, you have to have a password to look at the stored material on the USB drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, it's by default, all traffic on that, from that USB into the world goes through Tor. Which then you don't have to worry so much about, oh, am I really exercising the appropriate discipline, right? Um, just on a side note, you, you, you think, you, you really do need to talk to somebody before you jump in and assume that you have privacy using Tor. Uh, one of the things they, they say in the documentation is, if you're using Tor, do not use BitTorrent. You know BitTorrent, right? It's a file transfer mechanism. Oh, yeah. File for file sharing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, BitTorrent doesn't use Tor. It wants to grab hold of the Ethernet interface directly and completely bypasses all the encryption and proxy and protection. So if you're using Tor, and you use BitTorrent at the same time, you've just given yourself up. You have a VPN with BitTorrent? So VPN, you get to a certain point, but then it needs to still needs to go out into the open. Yeah. Right? They can track you. Your VPN provider can track you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's given. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So do you really trust your VPN provider so much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's really important information, maybe you need to think about the, how much protection VPNs actually give you. Well, just because you're not paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. It's true. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's an interesting use case. If uh, a victim of domestic abuse right, were to move to a different state and sends an email back to family saying, I'm OK, I'm alive, everything's OK, I've settled in, if the attacker, for whatever reason, is able to get a copy of that email, they can open up the header and look at the IP address from which that email was sent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Later on, I'll give you, a, the, the, there's a link about how to look that up. It, it's a quick Google search. Mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, if the attacker were able to get a copy of that email, they can see, huh, that IP address is, um, this uh, suburb west of Denver, I know exactly where they are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You've just given up. But if you use Tor, that last link might look like it came from France, uh, South America, uh, Albania, mm -hmm. or uh, you know somewhere in the Far East. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it can protect the privacy, the physical location of the victim of uh, domestic abuse or what other abuse? Okay, I'm going to probably. Uh, yes, go ahead. We have this person that's the victim of the. Same, we have, yes. Yeah. And she's sending via tour. Mm -hmm. To her mother. Yes. Does her mother have to be on tour? No. Aha. Uh -huh. Not necessary. Yes. Not necessary. No, because you the location of the mother is yeah. not doesn't okay. isn't, the isn't one of those protected right. things, right? right. Mm -hmm. But if the mother were to also <laughs> be uh, potentially a victim, well then, yes. then then you use. Um, then you use a, an encrypted email that is accessible through Tor. Okay, there's, a, there's an excellent package called Proton Mail. I, I think I, I, li I listed it further email, down. Right? Yeah. So protonmail.com is uh, hosted in Switzerland, so it has the protection of EU and Swiss privacy laws, and if you remember, uh, the Swiss are big on privacy, right? If you have a Swiss bank account, all you need is the number. They don't care what you're dressed like. You go in, give them the number, and they'll say, please come this way, ma'am. Right? <laughs> give you a private room, and you have access to your box, right? Um, so uh, ProtonMail, uh, I'd recommend it. ProtonMail actually comes with, a, with its own VPN, so you can turn uh, the email on or off or the VPN on or off independently. So uh, multiple people that could use Tor uh, and not go buy drugs, OK? Privacy. <clears throat> I think uh, I've already made my point. Tails is that USB, uh, bootable USB. Mm -hmm. if, if you want, um, it wouldn't take more than an hour. We just bring a couple of uh, 8 or 16 gig uh, USB drives. We'll get together at the Starbucks, download it, and install it, boot it, practice using it, OK? If, if you want. Um, Anonymous whistleblowing. Uh, secure drop is a Everybody turn off their phones, heart monitors, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so secure drop was uh, just, it just came out uh, a few years ago. Every major uh, news outlet in the world has a dark web drop site 
where a, a, a whistleblower using tails can anonymously communicate with a journalist, send files in, and uh, type a short message. Uh, and you, it's bi-directional. So the journalist can talk back to the, uh, to the whistleblower. Uh, if I, I, I'm going to make an offer. If you know of someone who has come across a cache of information and they want to submit it anonymously, of course they're free to just walk over to Channel 5 and put it on the counter, right? But uh, and actually, an anonymous way to do it is to not leave your fingerprints, but you know, pick it up with gloves, put it into an envelope, and mail it. That's pretty anonymous, actually. That's pretty good. Because the privacy of the postal system is still respected. Anyway, so uh, free software word of, yes? If they send the message over the internet, doesn't the journalist say have access to the IP address? No, because the intervening network is Tor, and both ends are anonymized. The location of both ends are anonymized. Only the content is delivered. No, it's it's a it's a non-trivial setup. Uh, what they do is, once the message is received, uh, the process actually involves the journalist copying it onto a USB and then taking that USB to a separate computer that's not connected to the internet before they even open up a, a PDF, right? Because some PDFs, when you open the PDF, they do things like phone home and they report, they, they make network connections from within the PDF. So the proper way to implement uh, SecureDrop it involves at least two computers one of them is connected to Tor, the other one is for actually reading and responding. Okay. Question here? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. There's something I'm missing here. I, maybe everybody else has gotten this. How does Bob get back to Alice if Bob does not know Alice's address? Oh, because uh, <clears throat> temporarily the connection has been set up. And Things have not yet been forgotten. So he has all the keys. He has all the relay information. Bob knows all the relay information. Peter and Paul, they're just passing the message along. Actually, on the way back, it probably will not be Peter and Paul. It might be two other mail, mail delivery people. Um, so how does he know, how does Bob know Alice's address, only if she gives it to him? It's, it's following the track back, right? Oh, because without having to know where right, she is. Exactly. Okay. Well, you know, so let me think. Yes, because the, the, the encryption keys and the path, right, are uh, embedded in all the envelope information. Okay. So, he, so he takes a reply, puts it in the last envelope, and gives it back to Paul. Okay. Paul puts it, reassembles the, the envelope, gives it to Peter. Peter reassembles another envelope and gives it to Alice. Mm -hmm. I, very important question. Uh, I, I'm not explaining the technology correctly, but it is clear there is a, a, uh, an encrypted mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. and that both ends, uh, well, the, the end on Tor is protected as far as the, the, the location. Mm -hmm. Now, excuse me, I know there yes. are a lot of questions, but use your judgment ah, how yes. many to answer in yes. order to still get through the material. Right. Oh, wow, okay, let's, uh, let's thank you for, uh, mm -hmm. onion share, simple to, simple to install, the beauty of OnionShare is it streams the file. So you're not limited to two gigabytes file size on a, you know, a, a file system limitation. If you had a 20 gigabyte video, 
and you needed to send it somewhere, you could make it available on Tor, so you're not revealing your personal location, you give the journalist or the receiver the Onion address on Tor, they go to an Onion browser, a Tor browser, and they can download by streaming it through the internet, through Tor. So, uh, you know, so many things uh, we, we end up with uh, facing uh, bigger than two gigabytes. How am I going to get it over there, right? Mm -hmm. From even legitimate users. Anyway, so this is a remote administration. If I had a high value asset in hostile territory and I needed to perform administrative tasks, is the disk full? How is the CPU percentage uh, running? If I went through conventional pathways, people would, you know, even if I used a VPN, they would know that it was me going in because they know where I come from, and they look at a VPN address. The tour would anonymize my location, and they would see connections coming into it from different countries, different locations. Each packet would be anonymized? Uh, each stream, yeah, each, each okay. session. Oh, but, session yeah, okay. uh, but you can switch a session to another another uh, stream anytime. There's a button right at the top of the Tor browser, and just reestablish a new new connection. What should you do? Uh, where are we? No, we'll go back to here. If you are responsible for a corporate network or a company network or an organization, I would recommend blocking the Tor. Right, because uh, I know the Winchester Public Library does not block Tor, mm -hmm. and but it would be almost trivial to take a small computer with a power supply, mm -hmm. have it connect to the library Wi-Fi, and make it a porn server on the uh, on the dark web. Put it behind the books that nobody <laughs> borrows, right? <laughs> and uh, or next to maybe Chinese liver. That one, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for for appropriateness, of course. But somebody maybe might actually Chinese borrow liver. that book, right? Yeah. So block it. Uh, there there are many ways to do that. So, but if you had organizational responsibility for a network, make sure you're people know the policy, that you have a policy that maybe it says you may only use Tor for legitimate business purposes and you will tell us you are using it for that purpose. Anything else will get you fired. Mm -hmm. Done. Right? If we find out through some mechanism that uh, you're, you're using it for criminal or not, not business purposes, it's, you might as well uh, be looking at dirty pictures on, on your Firefox. There are ways to use Tor through auditable, monitored, and tightly controlled conditions. Um, one model that I use, uh, that I propose in the secure remote administration is, you have your basic network, you have a DMZ. Limited numbers of people can go into the DMZ. You know who they are. A demilitarized zone. It's a fire. Right. It's a firewall. Was in Korea. No. Okay. Firewall zone, and so you have limited access to that server in that DMZ. And from there, every action, take every keystroke is logged and audited and reviewed. From there, you can let them go out to the to the dark web. And th that's one mechanism that you might, but you don't open it up for everybody, right? One of my mentors, Joe Benfield, said all software is defective. Somebody's going to find a defect in it. So think about 
the failure mode, you know, and never think about, oh, Tor safe, I don't have to worry about it if I use Tor. Well, you should always worry. I'm a worrier. And finally, the part that deals with uh, about your, the way you should approach Tor is to answer five questions. They come from Electronic Frontier Foundation. <coughs> they call it a threat model. I don't even know what a threat model is, but it's really asking five questions. What do I want to protect? From whom? How likely is it going to happen? What are the consequences? And how much effort am I willing to do to accomplish all of that? Right? Those are the five primary questions. When someone tells you, oh, you don't have antivirus, mm -hmm. do you really need antivirus? Do you really want to spend, what is it, 60, 70 bucks a year now for a, a commercial antivirus? And uh, when they're scanning your hard drive, you can't do anything else. Um, and you have to, you know, every, once a week, every two weeks, boom, there's a big download of new uh, signatures, and it, it gets in the way of a lot of things. Now, if the virus updates are getting in the way of getting your email done, all right, or just getting your work done on the computer, um, you got to think about what it is you want to protect. And uh, I'm sorry, I should not say, I should never suggest that you skip antivirus. Antivirus is one of the fundamental things everybody should continue to do. But, you know, uh, if you were to follow all the recommendations of all the security people out there, uh, you'd be spending all day patching, updating, and uh, you know, installing security software. You'd never get any work done at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the number five. You can get privacy without Tor. Uh, Signal, ProtonMail, StartPage is a privacy-enhanced browser. You know, when you go into Chrome and you do a search, and then next same afternoon you're seeing the ads for the thing you've searched for, right? Mm -hmm. Well, StartPage is based in the Netherlands. I've exchanged some emails with uh, one of the tech support people, and they have external auditors that have come in to review their mechanism and have given it a, a thumbs up. So um, any number of uh, these other tools, if they look interesting, drop me a note. So, Conclusion and takeaway, right? Un have your people that are using your network understand your policy, and that policy comes out of answering those five questions, mm -hmm. right? It only anonymizes location, it does not do anything else for you. So if you give them your real email address uh, over Tor, you've and anyway, you get it. Uh, continue to use standard security practices. You know, um, don't don't just give them up because you think you're safe on tour. Five questions. Talk among your trusted peers, and um, my buddy Sun Tzu, right, always said, "Know your enemy," because if you don't know your enemy, they'll beat you every every time. Any more questions? Any basic questions about this? Or, yes? Just simply in terms of what you're saying, hmm? is in as much as this tool, these tools, anonymizes uh, source and destination information, mm. source information, yeah. let's start yeah. right there, yeah. source information, uh, sniffing the network will still reveal the content. In theory, there is a level of encryption for every packet that's going through, because they're sealing in envelopes, right? Because when Paul receives the message from Peter, 
everything's been encrypted inside that envelope that Alice put it in, and then Peter put it in a second envelope. So when Paul receives it, it's been doubly sealed. So, so Tor will use go to Tor or an Onion server or yep. any, any, they will in fact They're, encrypt the content. Yes, they will. The process. Yes, they will. But I will go back to my friend Joe Benfield. All software is defective. So someday someone's going to be able to break into it. So good practice is use your own encryption on top of it, if you have a choice. Go ahead. Can you give me an example if I'm writing a letter to John here, mm -hmm. an email to John? Uh, what what do, do I do? Do I go to the telephone? How, how do I do okay. this? Okay, um, one, one mechanism is um, get the Tor browser, right? Uh, it, it's a it's a browser specifically set up to access Tor. Put in the address of a mail server on Tor. It's an onion address. So the server, the mail server, doesn't know where you are. What, what, what I'm trying to do is, if I want to send it to, I know his address is John at Verizon. You, yeah, OK. Do I put that in? Um, yes, no. So once you've logged into the ProtonMail server, for example, mm -hmm. OK, you open up a message. You say, I want to create a new message. And you can put in his John at Verizon Net. But you have to start with creating a ProtonMail account. Yes. Right. So that, so there that, are free. That, that, that answers part of your question. Right. Free so accounts. Instead, instead of your Gmail account, you now have a Proton Mail account. Right. And from your Proton Mail account, you send email to mm -hmm. whomever you want. Right. John at Verizon. Yes. John at right. Verizon. Yeah. Net. So it's transparent to you, except your starting point is a little different. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, did I say that correctly? Yes. No. <laughs> the thing is, if you wanted the message to be private. You would encourage John to get his own Pro Proton Mail account, <laughs> right? So the message doesn't pop out into the clear, and Verizon can read it. If you have a Proton Mail account and John has a Proton Mail account, it's all within that system. Now you still have to trust Proton Mail, but they promise that they're not. Uh, looking. How do I get John's proton address? He needs to sign up for his. Just let's say what you got his Verizon, Verizon address. How he gives it to you. He gives it to yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So I have to be in person. And yeah. well, or you, no, or you no. can send you a plain text email. Yeah. Please contact me at you know, John at protonmail.com. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's anonymous. Doesn't, that's anonymous. That doesn't sound totally private. No, um, no you're, you're right. They're to be easy. totally private. You want to use a Tor browser, go to the ProtonMail Tor site. John needs to do the same thing. Create your own account and then communicate between yourselves that way. So you have to call him on an encrypted phone first. <laughs> <laughs> or just come to a meeting, right? And give him yeah, a piece yeah. of paper. Or meet in the dark alley. <clears throat> no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yes. How much time do we have? We have. It's, what, okay. So, one thing I want to do is uh, come back to that thing that I mentioned before, which is privacy, right? Yes. What does privacy mean to you? Um, I hear a lot that. I'm an honest person. I have nothing to hide. Uh, I don't need privacy. Okay. Um, one of I, I, there's so many things I want to say about that. <laughs> one thing is I ask someone who would say that when you go to the bathroom, you like to close the door, right? When you go to the bathroom, you don't just use the doorstop and leave it wide open because what have you got to hide? <laughs> no, really. I, mean, 
I should just drop trial and do my business. And um, yet that would be a very small privacy risk. Yes, it's true. So somebody would call the cops on you, right? Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> turn around! <laughs> <laughs> Except for social norms, that's very low risk. Yeah, it's privacy. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm an honest person. I don't have anything to hide except my phone number from spam. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do we yeah. get rid of that? Well, different, different problem. Yeah, different problem. Different problem. No, always problem. somebody knowing my number. Well, okay, I have to ask you, how did they get it? Well, probably when, every I, ordered, time you when I ordered a sweater from yes, Alex. Right. Once you've given out that number, okay, you've given up one of the most valuable modern day pieces of personal property, okay? Um, so, on that point though, okay, two things. Many phone companies are working, may not feel like it, but they are working very hard to reduce the number of spam calls. I use uh, AT&T Call Protect. Mm -hmm. There's a paid service and a free service. I tried the paid service, it's, it's okay, uh, I'm, but it, I don't want to pay four bucks a month, so I'm dropping back to the free service. Um, it's able to detect potential fraud, likely spam, okay? Now, as with anything where you're trusting something else to make your decisions for you, okay, it'll often make the wrong, wrong decision. So I dropped the car off at Pep Boys in Virginia to check my tire pressure. It was a little bit low. Left my phone number. Didn't get a call back. So I finally called them back and I said, hey, so was my, uh, what did you find with the tire? It says, we left you a voicemail because you didn't pick up. Well, I found out later the AT&T Call Protect blocked it because it was a number I had never dealt with, right? So it thought it was spam and uh, it never rang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, good sides, bad sides about you know yeah. more active blocking of uh, numbers versus letting them through. Yeah, but you can use services that will block the call, but will still allow the voicemail. Yes, right. In fact, they left. It. They did leave a voicemail. It just takes. And so you months. just have to remember in your own head if this was sure. a new business I've never done business yeah. with. I've got to be checking my voice. Yes, yeah. right, right. Texting works the same. Yes, way. yep, exactly. No, but uh, so you know, yes, we do want fewer junk calls, but the more actively we enforce the blocking, the risk increases of blocking a, a legitimate call that you really are mm -hmm. hoping to get. And it's not from the Irish lottery, right? The, uh, it's another scam. Right. No, so Nigerian. part of telephone hey, don't number. Hey, my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> He's a prince. Really? He well, was a prince. He was a prince. Well, <laughs> clearly, both of you were princes. <laughs> princes among men. OK, so specifically on telephones, if you have already, I've already sold my soul to Google. Right, I use Gmail. If you already have a Google account, you can get a Google Voice number. It's free. They don't charge for it, right? And so I have a Google Voice number, which if you call the number, I use it to fill out forms, okay? And uh, do, uh, when, when they need to send a text to do the validation of identity mm -hmm. things, right? I use the Google Voice number, right? Because it can receive text as well. And uh, so, what I have it, the way I have it set up, and you can choose to do it differently, is it's going to permanent do not disturb. You call the number, it goes to, uh, goes to voicemail. Google will do a text, no, voice to text conversion, put the message in an email, and drop it in my mailbox. 
and retain that forever and have, have access to all your, your conversations. Yeah. Well, because they scan it. Yeah, they do. They do. Well, Chromecast does that too. Can they? Okay, that's yeah. good. Well, right? That's what the NSA get it. Voice, and also, uh, many of the VoIP providers do the same thing. Oh, absolutely. They give you yeah. a yeah, dashboard. Right. You can so control. there's a downside. Does the same thing. Yeah. But, but the nice thing is, We've migrated. Your, your real phone, the one that you're expecting legitimate calls to come in, is a little bit cleaner, right? It, it's l known to fewer people, and, uh, and hopefully those fewer people are the ones that are going to use that number. The, everything else, right, your subscriptions, your online accounts and whatever, can go through the Google Voice or some other uh, number. On the point of privacy and uh, telephone numbers, right? There's a service called Hush Phone, okay? And it's uh, maybe not for us, but our uh, kids and their kids and their friends, okay? Hush Phone provides for a few bucks an app where you have a working telephone number, you can make and place calls, you can send and receive text, right? And it's only for uh, a few bucks for a week, okay? So, use case. If you have one of your kids stumble onto a situation where they are going on a blind date, you have no idea who these people are, right? Give them a hushed phone number worth three bucks, five bucks, right? And if it's not working out, the person that you don't really want to contact, your son or daughter, <laughs> nephew, <laughs> they can call that number again and you know, you're just cutting them out of the system. If they have if the other person has uh, emotional problems or is, oh, give me another chance, and they're calling day and night, and you don't, you don't want to you know, shut off your phone because you're expecting other calls, well, you redirect them to the hushed phone. And when the, when the relationship is uh, developing to a good point, you give them a real number. But if it's not going to work out, you cancel the, the hush phone account, and at least that pathway is, uh, is cut out. So privacy, right? What else are we... Uh... So the data center, I, I, I worked for a big phone company and we had big data centers and we had uh, an interesting uh, collision of ideas, right? The security people said, don't put the logo outside, you're making us a target, right? <laughs> and the, uh, the, the marketing people said, we gotta have the biggest logo around, you know, we're gonna show our customers uh, how, what, how, what a great cool uh, system we have. You mean outside that kind of building? Yeah, yeah, okay. you know, so, you know, the, there's a big data center in uh, Watertown, right? I, I used to drive by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a hint. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just plain, plain cinder block. In fact, the plainer it is, the more likely it is, it's, it's, a, it's a data center, right? <laughs> 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 but uh, we had that, uh, you know, collision between the marketing people and say, well, how am I going to tell uh, our clients, you know, their, their uh, data is coming through here and it's really cool, shiny and beautiful if we don't, have, uh, we don't have a nice logo on the outside, right? So, um, privacy, privacy, yeah, okay. So, privacy in searching, right? Like I was saying before, um, you can use start page. You don't have to use Tor to get some level of privacy. Start page is a, start page is a system uh, owned and operated by people in the Netherlands. Now they have systems all over the world. But the idea is 
you go to start page and hit search. The start page will search Google for you and give you the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, um, isn't that what DuckDuckGo is? DuckDuckGo is an American company that does very much the same thing, right? So you go to DuckDuckGo, DuckDuckGo searches Google for you having stripped out all of your information, right? So the request looks like it's coming from DuckDuckGo, fresh, no prior cookies or other information. So you, it brings it back and presents it to you. Now, yes? Just, I'm, I'm a little confused. Yeah. I thought DuckDuckGo was an independent search engine because on my phone, I have the opp opportunity to select the search provider. Google is one of them, I can add another one, yeah, and DuckDuckGo right. is a search provider. Mm -hmm. So my understanding was it is a, a search provider that forgets. It doesn't, doesn't yes, contain any that's information, true. Yeah. as opposed to going to Google. Right. So Google never go, knows yes. that I, you know, I searched for beautiful women on Mars. Yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, I think we're not in disagreement yet, right? So start page goes to Google, DuckDuckGo goes to Google, or it can go to other search engines. DuckDuckGo is independent, no. it's private. It, DuckDuckGo okay. does its own search, it does not go to Google. No, it says well, it, it uses Google. the Google engine. Oh, yeah. oh, it does go to yeah. Google. It, it's, a, it's a proxy for you. Okay, yeah. so, the, uh, so, the, so, so the cookies that Google picks up are DuckDuckGo yes. cookies. Yes, right, okay. it, it, instead of your own. I just so it's that thank you for yeah. Okay. yeah. The comment I've heard is that DuckDuckGo gives its uh, responses are very brief, whereas Start Page gives you more information. There's yeah. more than one. Or something. Well, I've, I've been using DuckDuckGo for years, and yeah. I've never it's had a complaint. Fine. So it gives you it, enough. Yeah. It gives me enough. So good. No. So there's two things about the those two products. I I don't know about DuckDuckGo, but if you use it, maybe you could help me understand. Mm -hmm. On start page, they have not only the list of results, mm -hmm. yeah. but see, when you have the list of results, if you click on the link, you're revealing yourself to it, that, that party, right? If, um, if uh, I were In any to, browser, why don't you do that? Well, no, no, so start page has a proxy for the search result as well. So, I don't know about that, that thing. Okay, mm -hmm. but uh, so there, there's at least one difference. The other difference is DuckDuckGo, being an American company, was subject to American, U.S. Uh, federal law enforcement, and were went through a situation where information finally leaked out that law enforcement required them to turn over records they promised to forget but you know when when a judge has a court order telling you to provide this information and uh in fact they were told you may not tell anyone that you're providing this information mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not atypical right you've seen it before right so um but didn't didn't the u.s government have a court order for switzerland as well getting getting records from Switzerland, the Swiss banks? Not, you know, there, there Swiss banks, yes. yes. Swiss yeah, banks, right. yes. Swiss bank. well, yeah. So I guess yeah. the whole Swiss security thing. Yeah. yeah. No, but no. the banks, they said you can't do business in the United States if you conceal yeah. bank accounts. Yeah. You can't do business yeah. here. Yeah. Which, which meant that they'd be out of business. All right. well, so so yeah. internet records are, are different and, and therefore they're not subject to this to the same well, it's a different topic. It's complicated, yeah. yeah. It's like we go to Switzerland, try to create an anonymous bank account, and they'll say, no, thank you. Now. Right. Well, mm -hmm. well, maybe it depends on how much money you have. <laughs> so you go, to, you go to the Cayman instead. That's right. Something like that. Yes. So Question. how does Start Page and DuckDuckGo uh, get money to pay for Okay. I, I, uh, in the ex I, I asked that question specifically to the person from Start Page, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, there are paid levels, and they also sell uh, Start Mail, which is a privacy-enhanced mail. Mm -hmm. So both Proton Mail and uh, Start Mail have a mechanism where they use two levels of passwords. Mm -hmm. 
it can be configured to use two levels of passwords. One, to log into the account, see how, what, the, what, the, uh, what the messages are. But the second one encrypts the contents of your message. So what they say is, if Interpol or whatever comes into the Swiss offices and they confiscate all the ProtonMail servers, they know the account, they know your account password, but they cannot read the message because only you have the password. Mm -hmm. How does the receiver get the, uh, the key? Yeah, so mm -hmm. like I said, my, my, it's like my mentor... It's like, the, it's like the early Lotus Notes stuff. You yeah. know, Lotus Notes used two keys as well. Way back when. Yeah, way back. Mm -hmm. um, so I go back to uh, my mentor, Joe Benfield, all software is defective, and it's only as good as the, the lock on it, right? Because if I send, if I have a ProtonMail account, and you have a ProtonMail account, and I encrypt it with my key, and you would decrypt it with your key, somewhere in the middle, there's this, in, you know, fuzzy space where... I noticed did this public key, private key thing. Yeah. yeah. Where, mm -hmm. where right, right. you were able to do it. And I'm not sure how that yeah. works. It's been around for 25 years. I, I think yeah. that Phil says right up front that if it's free, you're going to get advertising. They're selling Is advertising, that right? okay. yeah, but they're not going to—they're not going to let the advertisers uh, get right, right, right. They'll—they'll right. they'll, they'll provide advertising right. as one of the income sources, but uh, yeah. So the Start Page is based in the Netherlands, so in theory they have a different uh, legal structure. I, I don't even know. What else uh, to say about that? The EU privacy is uh, a lot They're doing a lot better than uh, some of us, yeah. So when you do, when you do a search on a disease, right, in Chrome, um, if you don't want to worry other members of your family that are, <laughs> uh, that are like using the same syphilis. Or something. Oh, no, no, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Charlie. It was just getting interesting. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, you know, having thought a little bit about, uh, that's, you know. That's yeah. built into my iPhone. I mean, I, when I search on my iPhone, I get a uh, choice. Yeah, you know, well, it's, it's very hard because that search could be tied to your IP address. Whether... You know, when, when uh, people use the anonymous mode in Firefox and in Chrome, right, incognito mode, yeah. all they're doing is they're removing the cookies, oh. if that, right? But the IP address from which you're making that connection is well known. And uh, believe me, the AI is looking at that data and saying, here's Charlie. And then here's an anonymous person of coming from the same IP address, and it looks like it's a it's the same Windows machine, right? Because they can tell the browsers can tell what operating system you're using and which font you have. It's called fingerprinting. Thank it's you. A standard uh, right. industry term. Yeah. And, and they got your fingerprint. They, so they know your IP address. They they know what uh, font you've got installed. They know. I, I don't know what the incognito actually does for you. Makes right? you feel better. Makes it feel better. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. No, but uh, the, so the benefit of Tor would be you go into the Tor network and you pop out somewhere in the world and you go to. Now, nothing is without some level of cost, right? If you're, it turns out three hops or four is about adding more hops. Right, in more relays in between you and the place you want to get to, more than three or four doesn't seem to improve any security. So that, that's what people have uh, analyzed. So, but even going through three or four uh, hops, I think we're actually done with, uh, I'm going to turn the lights back on, okay? So after three or four hops, uh, you're not getting any more uh, any better security, but every one of those hops 
introduces a delay, a latency, right? So it's probably not ideal for real time, like voice calls over the tour, because you're going through hop, hop, hop to the other end. Mm -hmm. it, it, these are additional hops along the way that uh, would not be if you had a, a straight connection. You're already going through service provider routers and switches and so forth that are going to slow you down. Um, bandwidth, the uh, size of the pipe, how many megabytes you can transfer in a second, um, is going to be limited by the relay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, not, it's not perfect for everything. But if you're sending an email, if you're sending a short message or you just want to do a quick lookup, uh, Tor is, uh, is, is a reasonable alternative, I think. Yes? So there's one weak link, I think, that isn't addressed by Tor, hmm. and that's your ISP. Actually, yes, right. No, so uh, your ISP will know that you're using Tor, and they'll know that you're going, they'll, they'll know the first relay you touch. But you can switch that around. The, the, the first relay is randomly selected among tens of thousands of relays. Sure, but, yeah. but when, when, the, when the message, the packet goes out of your computer yeah. and hits the ISP firewall, yeah. before that, it, that's recorded. Yes, right. And they, they know, RCA, that, that's, and Absolutely. That's why it's, it's always good to encrypt your stuff before you send it out. If you can do now, it, VPNs will do at least that much. Yep, yep. But VPNs tend to slow you down too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now okay. you're encrypting, decrypting, sending it through some other place, and and that goes back to your point: is you know, what what's the cost to you of the privacy? Right. Mm -hmm. How much are you willing to pay? Right? And, and the yeah. payment can be latency. Yep. yep. If yep. you don't need mm -hmm. instant feedback. Yeah. You know, you're not waiting, you know, nanoseconds yep. to determine whether you're going to launch a nuclear attack. Yep. You don't have to worry about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So for most people, and it is nanoseconds for most people, yeah. especially yeah. with today's technology. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't see it. Think back to when uh, we used to do dial-up and watch the picture kind of paint itself down. <laughs> uh, the good old days. Yeah. Right? We could return to some of those good old days. The good old days were characters. They didn't have such a thing oh. as pictures. Yeah, OK. Yeah. For some of us. The good old days, they didn't have computers. I still, oh, Charlie, please. I still have the Radio Shack 300 baud modem. Yeah. Oh, yes. To go to the trash heap. Well, the trash yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, those and, the trash yeah. Yeah. and when yeah. you, you could yeah. actually yeah. read the text as I it came in, my <laughs> <laughs> it was so slow. Yes. Yeah, but it worked. It, it worked. It but you know something? Those slow things came in handy because there was a, a space project one time where the normal new one was scrapped out. Yeah. The old one worked. It took yeah. a few months and they didn't look at it, but it came in. Um, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I know I have to tell you. Yeah, thank you.